VRFs do for routing what VLANs do for switching. But when and how do you use them? Let's find out. It's getting rare to find a flat network these days. We just can't get away with it anymore. The modern network needs to be separated into areas. This may be for business units. Maybe you have an R&D team, and they need to be kept separate to the customer service team. Or maybe you're a multi-tenanted service provider. It's no good to have your customer traffic mixing. Or maybe your company has acquired another business, and their network uses the same IP space that you do. How will you merge your networks now? Or it could just be for good old-fashioned security. You want to keep your secure data separate from your DMZ data. There are plenty of reasons to segregate data. VLANs are a very common way to start doing this. VLANs aren't new, of course. They've been around since the dawn of networking time, and we've been using them all with great success. But as you know, VLANs only separate traffic at layer 2. It's like creating virtual switches throughout your environment. The result is that hosts in a VLAN can communicate with each other, but not with hosts in other VLANs. Until they get external help, that is. As soon as you put a router between these networks, your separation is lost. The hosts can communicate between VLANs again. To solve this problem, you could use a firewall instead of using a router. Or you may use ACLs on the router to selectively block traffic. This may work, just depending on what you need. But this may not be the best solution, in particular with multi-tenancy, as your customers wouldn't be able to make changes on the firewall without seeing other customer data. Also, it doesn't help when you're having overlapping IP spaces. Another option is to use VRFs. VRFs are used to segregate data at layer 3. I've even heard of some people calling them layer 3 VLANs, although that's not actually correct, so don't do that. By default, a router will have a global routing table. Just one routing table where all routes, whether learned or local, are added. This is why those VLANs can communicate when a router is present. A VRF changes this default behavior. A VRF is a virtual routing table. In the same way that a VLAN breaks a switch into virtual switches, a VRF breaks a router into virtual routers. Now interfaces, and by extension VLANs, belong to a single VRF. Networks within a VRF can communicate. Networks in different VRFs cannot. There is simply no routes between the VRFs. This is something that's easier to see in action, so let's build a lab and configure some VRFs. In our little pretend business here, we provide services to our customers. We have one router, and each of our customers has one router. All routers are running Cisco IOS. Keep in mind that the commands you see here are a little different in other flavors of routers, like NXOS, but the principles all remain the same. Our customers also have some IP space that overlaps. We need to prevent this from becoming an issue. To build this network, we're going to create two VRFs, one per customer. The initial configs, like hostname, IP addresses and so on, have already been completed to save time. I'll put the initial and completed configs on the website if you want to do the lab yourself. We start by creating a VRF for each customer and giving them a description. The description is optional, but it helps later on when you're troubleshooting. Creating a VRF essentially creates a new empty routing table. But what's the point of a routing table if there's nothing in it? So we need to add some interfaces. Before we do, we'll have a quick look at the current interface config. You'll see why I'm doing this soon. And now we'll go into the interface configuration and we add it into the VRF. Now, here's something surprising. When you add an interface to a VRF, all layer three config on the interface is lost. It's a good thing we had a look at the interface config before we started, isn't it? So let's add that IP address back in. And here we get surprise number two. In iOS, we need to make sure that IPv4 is enabled on the VRF. We do this by going back into the VRF definition and entering the IPv4 address family. If you're not familiar with the term, an address family is used to tell the router how a particular protocol should behave. In our case, we're not going to set anything. 
we're just entering into the mode to enable IPv4 on the VRF. And while we're at it, we'll do the same for the second customer. Now if we go back into the interface, adding the IP address is fine. Let's try a ping to this customer's router. This is failing right now, but that's expected. When we ping, we use the global routing table by default. The global routing table is the normal routing table that all routers have, whether they're using VRFs or not. This network is no longer in the global routing table, which is why the ping fails. So to fix this, we can ping using a particular VRF. And we can see here that that works just fine. So now let's repeat this process for customer B. Remember to have a look at the IP address on the interface before starting. Notice here that we're only configuring the core router. We don't need to touch the customer routers. This is because VRFs are locally significant. Routers do not need to share VRF information. Okay, now we can take this a step further and add routes to the customer's networks. Here we also need to specify the VRF. If we don't, the routes go into the global routing table. Also notice that there is no problem at all adding overlapping routes as long as they go into different VRFs. Now we'll take a look at the routing tables to see how this looks. The global routing table is completely empty. We've moved everything out of here into the customer VRFs. Keep in mind though, you can still use the global routing table alongside VRFs. We can see the customer routes in the customer VRFs. you can see that the 10.10.0.0 network is in both customer routing tables. Time to run a few ping tests. We can successfully ping customer networks when we use customer VRFs. We can also see that overlapping IP space is fine as well. If we try to ping customer A from customer B, this will fail. This is where you can really see the traffic separation in action. The main point that I want you to remember from all of this is that a VRF is a virtual routing table. They are used to separate traffic at layer three. Now, let's go have a look at another scenario. Let's say that customers want to be able to communicate. However, this needs to happen via a firewall. This might sound like an unrealistic scenario, but it's not as bad as it sounds. Imagine, for example, that as an enterprise network, Instead of having customers inside your network like this, you have an inside network and a DMZ. You may do this using VRFs, so you can easily find yourself in this scenario. So let's grow our original topology. We now have a firewall and a single physical link to the core router. This is a trunk link, and we'll use a subinterface for each customer. The firewall itself is in routed mode, so the core router will keep traffic separate and the firewall will route traffic from one customer to another, if the security policy allows it. There's two things to be aware of here. First, the firewall does not have VRFs. All routes go into its global routing table. And second, we can't allow the overlapping IP spaces to mix. In this scenario, the firewall has already been configured. That's because we're not focusing on firewall configuration here, we're looking at VRFs. So if you're interested in how that's put together, I'll put all the config files on the website and then you can do your own labs if you want to later. Now, we'll start by getting the connection to the ASA up. Part of this includes creating a subinterface on VLAN 10, adding it to the customer VRF and configuring an IP address. And then the same process is repeated on customer B using VLAN 20.
Now's a good time to double check that we have access to the ASAs on both VRFs. Now we can add routes so that customer A can reach customer B. The ASA is the next hop. We won't add routes for the overlapping IP address space. Once again, you can't mix overlapping IP address spaces. You need to completely separate them or avoid them. And we do the same thing for customer B, the equivalent routes there. Now, I'm going to bring up customer A's router over on the side here. And running this trace confirms that traffic is indeed being passed through the firewall. If I bring customer B's router over here as well, we get the same result. Wonderful. Everything so far has used static routing, but what about dynamic routing? Can we use OSPF, EIGRP, and BGP with VRFs? The answer is most definitely yes. IGPs can work with VRFs. So we're gonna build that topology and configure all three of these routing protocols along with VRFs in the next video.